hey, so listen, man, we've got some work to do. Um, important message, I think, because uh, it ends our series, and it is, um, I think it's a great reality check for us. We've been in a four-week series called Smile, The Art of Being Happy. And we've been talking about, like, man, it seems like if you look at Scripture, there is a direct command And God's not going to command us to do something that he doesn't also empower us to do through his spirit. But there's like a direct command for believers in their pursuit of Christ to enjoy, pursue, and actually get better at being happy. I don't know if you've heard that message a lot. I don't know if you grew up in church hearing that message. Um, And we're not splitting hairs over happiness and joy and gladness and rejoicing. We're, we're, We're just saying, hey, like the theme here is that those who know the Lord should have a happy heart. Like, like, it goes along with the gospel. Um, and then we've been talking about some of the habits of happiness. So, so how can I actually do things that would increase my happiness in the Lord? And we're not also saying, we're not separating happiness and holiness either. We're, we're actually saying as one increases, so too does the other. We're not saying you can be happy outside of holiness just by doing whatever you want. We're actually saying you increase your happiness in holiness, but never to the expense of happiness. Like, the scriptures are clear. We serve a happy God who wants his people to enjoy him and his good gifts. And so we've been looking at that. We spent a couple weeks on different areas of that. And then so this week, uh, and a lot of this has been inspired by Randy Alcorn's book, Happiness. Highly recommend. It's a, it's a big, long book. Ton of scripture in there. Lots of quotes. Uh, if you're not a reader, listen to it. Okay, you know, get it on Audible. It's, a, it's, it's a, a fantastic. I'm even in the midst of listening to it right now. Um, and so I would highly encourage you guys uh, to listen to it and, and, you know, be blessed by it. Uh, he's also the, the guy who wrote the book called Heaven, who maybe you heard of that and talks a lot about, like, what heaven's going to be like. Um, and so maybe that would make a great future series as well because happiness and heaven, man, those are two things I know that my heart can really get around. And, uh, and they're, they're, they're birthrights of, of Christians. And so I wanted to orient you a little bit to what we're doing. Now today... Uh, and it's not because I've, there's been any negative feedback or anything necessarily. It's just a reality check today. Today is, how, how can we maintain this gladness of heart? How can we pursue the art of being happy in the midst of our world? Like, we live in a seriously broken, harmful world. And there's a lot of bad stuff that goes down that you're, you're preaching on happiness, but... but what I wanted to do is I wanted to, I wanted to take the, the reality of our call to rejoice in the Lord at all times, and I wanted to place it in the midst of a world and even a person that doesn't work right and explore, well, how do we do that? How do we actually um, pursue Jesus and the happiness that he has for us in the midst of many of the terrors that we live in? What does that look like? Because the Lord would never ask us to pretend or, or paint on a smile or, 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 or um, you know, just kind of fake it. We're going to talk about genuine joy in the midst of brokenness. So uh, let me pray, and we're going to hop right in and work through some things. Father, we ask that your spirit would come upon us. We even taste him now. Holy Spirit, we worship you. We say thank you, and we pray that we would know the depths and the heights. We would know the ups and the valleys. That we would know the full circumference to what we can know in our finite minds of your love for us, Jesus, and how you desire for us to have happy hearts. I pray that the sensitivity and the kindness with which you move into difficulty would be ours today. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Psalm 68, 3 says this, the godly are happy, they rejoice before God and are overcome with joy. That's a statement from the Psalms. I just want to base what we're saying here in biblical text. Who is happy? The godly. The godly are happy. They rejoice before God, and they're overcome with joy. We'll, talk, we'll take a look about why that is and, and how we maintain that. But that is, a, that is an is. It is a fact, according to what the Scripture has to say to us. And, and so let's take a look at what um, author and pastor Tim Keller has to say about the dynamic of, can that be true in the midst of brokenness? Can I actually have a broken and happy heart at the same time? I believe the answer is yes. While other worldviews lead us to sit in the midst of life's joys, foreseeing the coming sorrow, Christianity empowers its people to sit in the midst of this world's sorrows, tasting the coming joy. I love that about Christianity. I love that about my God, is my God never um, asks me to escape 
When you start thinking about happiness or heaven or what's to come or what's now, it's never like an escapism as though your abuse never happened. As though that school shooting never happened. As though your addiction isn't a current reality. Like the scriptures never ask you to escape reality in order to get something better. Rather, it, it calls us to sit with people, even if that people is yourself, in the midst of their sorrow while being able to taste a joy that will outlast that sorrow. I want to know how this happens and, and how we get this. And so let's, let's do a little theological work. So the theology of happiness is uh, Romans 5, 1 through 5. And, um, you know, you, you're going to have an outline uh, with you that might be helpful to follow because there will be parts where I move a little bit faster than others. Um, and so, you know, you, you may need to kind of go back and meditate on some of the scriptures or some of the things that we've said here. And there's some places for you to take some notes. If you want to do that, if you're a note taker, uh, we'd, we'd love to invite you to do that. Romans 5, uh, 1 through 5. Romans is a book written to the believers in Rome by this guy named the Apostle Paul. And in, in chapter 5, he's talking about, um, uh, he's sort of the main theme, if you will, is that we as Christians have hope. And that, that um, like, hope is that, is that thing that uh, it's certain, it may be unseen at, at times, but it's, it's that thing that is precious beyond all. If you're a Lord of the Rings fan, and you know my friend Gollum, and you can hear his gravelly voice saying, my precious, my precious. Just ungravel it, make it kind of cool, and think about that's how we look at hope as Christians. It's like our, it's like our precious it's our precious. So I want to talk about, man, what is it about hope that, that leads to happiness? And what does that have to do with suffering? Let's, let's hop in because this is where Paul, this is where he hops into the, to the, to the Christians in Rome who understood a broken and depraved and evil world, just like ours. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, this will be on your outline. This one will also be up here on the screen. Since we have been justified by faith, what that means is there's a, there was a legal court hearing. I don't know if you know about this or not. This, this is legal language. So if there's any lawyers in the house, this is your moment to shine, okay? Here's what Paul says. Legally, if, if you've come to this place of understanding yourself to be a sinner and that God should punish, like God has to in his holiness bring a wrath against you and the punishment is eternal separation from God and all that's good. If you realize that that's how you were born and that's who you are outside of Jesus and you've come to this place where you're like, but God, you love me anyways. You know the depths of the wickedness of my own heart and you love me and you want me anyways and you sent your son to be punished in my place and you believe that Christ took on your personal sin by sin by sin and was devastated by the Father so you wouldn't have to be, if you believe that he died your death and on the third day rose from the dead, if you believe that he's your treasure, he's your life, that, that he is the only way that you could be made right with God and be made whole as a person, if you've come to that kind of conviction, then there was a legal court hearing where you have already been declared justified, like you and God are good, never to be bad again. These promises that I'm going to talk about today are for you. If that's not you, don't misunderstand me. I never want to give false hope. This hope belongs to believers. If you're not a believer, man, we, we would do two things. We would invite you to become a believer today, to come and surrender your life to the person and way of Jesus. And if that's not where you are, then we would, continue, we would invite you to continue to like, be curious with this Christian community and look at us, and watch us how we live this out. Be curious about his word, because the hope and the promises that we are going to talk about today are specifically for those who've come to be justified through Christ, followers of Christ. We have peace with God. That's shalom. We have peace, God, God in us. We have, we have this perfect harmony that what we used to have back in the garden that was ruined by sin. Now, if you're a believer in Christ, you have that with God. Um, through the Lord Jesus Christ, through him, it's Jesus, we've also obtained access by faith into the grace in which we stand. So now it says that we stand in grace. Okay, so there's a, there's, we have a standing before God, and it's a standing of unmerited favor. Like, God has no reason to, to like, shower you with his affection besides the fact that it brings him great delight. Like, you weren't an A student, you weren't on the all-star roster, you weren't a first-round draft pick. 
Like, like none of that applies to us spiritually. But God, just because it gives him great pleasure to shower people like me and people like you with his affection, that's why you have it. And that's where you stand. Those are pretty good reasons to be happy. Like, no matter what. It says this, we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Okay, so Paul starts talking with the end in mind. If you know one of our pastors, John O'Brien, that's one of the things that he's like famous for saying, begin with the end in mind. So if you're going to run a marathon, you know, you can, it's cool to think about what it's going to feel like to finish. It's cool to think about the accomplishment of it at the end. It actually motivates you through some of the pain during. So Paul begins with the end in mind. He's like, man, you can have great hope in what's to come. But what's awesome about Christianity, what's awesome about like Jesus is that he doesn't just say, don't, it's not just there, it's also now. Verse three, not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings. Now that's not, that's not like common. You're not going to hear that in a ton of like TED Talks probably or a ton of like modern day philosophy. I mean, you might hear some of that, um, but you see this over and over and over again, that we are to rejoice, that we are to be glad, that we are to have happy hearts, not just when things are going well, although that's cool too, but in the midst of our sufferings, that's when we rejoice as well, in our sufferings, not when. Sometimes we, we find ourselves, I find myself in this mindset of like, when this passes, I will be happy again. If you could just, so I know I'm not alone, slide up your hand and tell me if you can relate to that. Oh, sweet. Okay. I'm at home with the fam. Great. I'll be happy when. And then I like put my happiness on hold until things work out to the way I think they should work out. But then I can't seem to keep that. I lose it so quick. And then I go back to I'll be happy when. So the, the cool thing about, about what Jesus is calling us to do is he takes that pressure off. He's like, no, you be happy in the midst of your suffering. Okay. Well, why, man? I'd like to know why. And, and here we can talk about suffering. What is suffering? You know, there, there's there's probably a bit more of a personal aspect to this context of the suffering, like what's going on personally. But I think the broader context as you look at the scriptures is not only what's going on to you and in you, but also like the suffering in the world around you. Remember, Christianity has a holistic perspective. It's not just always personal. Um, and so, um, well, so why? He goes on. Knowing that suffering, it does something. It produces endurance. All right, that's cool. But now if you're like me, I would probably say, I can do without the endurance, just give me a comfortable life. Again, can I get some hands if you, if you relate to that? Okay, all right, cool. Again, I like being with the fam. <laughs> I like being with the fam. Um, I can do without endurance, I'm fine. I just keep me comfortable and give endurance to like Brother Mitch. He, and I'll watch him and I'll encourage him and I'll think that's cool and then I'll die and it'll be over and I will thank the Lord for my comfortable life. <laughs> Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope, our precious. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Man, there's something about hope that you cannot live this life without. Let me tell you, as one who tastes and sees both suffering and the hope that comes from suffering, I can tell you that although there is a side of my heart that is prone toward comfort, there is an even greater side because of the Holy Spirit that lives within me that loves hope. I'm like addicted to it. I need more of it and I'm willing to suffer for it. That's what happens with all of our addictions, is it not? We're willing to suffer for them. The scriptures simply invite us to replace anything less with hope. So what is it about hope? What is it, what is it about um, this, this thing that the Lord wants to give to us that will somehow increase our experience of our real treasure, which is Jesus? How does that work out? How is it that through hope we get more Jesus? How does hope and happiness work out? Um, we're going to explore uh, some of that. And so, and so a couple of things that, that hope does uh, along the way which are imperative uh, to your happiness. Psalm 16.9 says, Therefore my heart is glad 
and my glory rejoices, my flesh also will rest in hope. So we can see that the gladness of heart and hope, man, they go together. There's something that happens when hope comes to your heart that will increase and augment your happiness. But don't miss me. It seems as though God's main avenue to hope is through suffering. I'm not saying it's his only. It's not a prerequisite. But it seems as though oftentimes, especially because this was the pattern of our master Jesus, that the way of suffering does something to us that no other way can and will be beautiful beyond compare. So what, how does this work out, man? How does this work out? There's a couple things that hope does uh, that affects our happiness uh, directly. The first thing that hope does is it informs it informs. Um, we're going to look at a few uh, verses here briefly that just kind of give us some idea of, of how a hope informs us uh, in the midst, especially of our suffering. And when I say hope, I mean hope in Christ. The promises that we have as believers in Christ, which is why I started this message by saying, this is for those who belong to Jesus. If you don't belong to Jesus, the idea is that you would hear that and be like, man, that sounds awesome. I want that. I want him. I want someone who could bring me that. And we can introduce you to that person. It informs. It informs. Um, important thing about information as it pertains to my happiness, especially in suffering, if I don't have the right information, my heart will move to panic. Can anybody relate to that? Anybody relate? Really, you didn't know this was going to be an active message. It is. We're not, you're not even amening it. You're like amening bad stuff, but it's true stuff, okay? So that's cool. If I don't have the right information about a situation, I will panic. That, that's just the natural bent of my heart. And so hope informs me. It's super important that you have the right information when you're suffering, or else your heart too will move to panic. And it's incredibly hard. I've never seen it done. I've never seen it done where somebody is lost in panic and happiness at the same time. How does it inform us? Genesis 2.17 says this. Um, God was talking to, um, you know, he was talking to the, the original two, Adam, Adam and Eve, and he was saying, look, if, if you obey me, if you choose me, you're going to live. But if you choose away from me, he was specifically talking about this tree and going to eat fruit. Basically, the idea was if you, if you try to find your life outside of me, you're going to die. You're going to die. And so what we know, according to the biblical narrative, is that they actually did historically choose away from God, and they historically died. But what's interesting is they didn't die physically at first. They died spiritually. They lost their connection with God. They were separated from God. They then, well, they then began to die physically. They got old. They aged. There was a curse that came among them and came upon the world. And it ruined everything. It broke everything. Not completely, but it broke everything to the point where it's almost now like, like when, when you walk through this world, there are shards of glass that will eventually cut you because of the way that God's shalom was originally broken in sin. That's true of you personally, it's true of me, and it's true of our world around us. So things like died from the way they were supposed to be. God said it was gonna happen, they made that choice, sin entered the world, and then things died. Now, we still maintain God's image, and there's still good in the world. Those things are still true, but it's a broken form of what it used to be. And it's important that you know that the world is not as it should be, and you are not as you should be. So when things go bad, that is the world being the world. When you go bad, that is you being you. Now, for those of us who are in Christ, the Holy Spirit has come to renew that, to make that new again, to create a new person in us that through us, there's newness actually coming not only to us, but to those around us. So God is writing a new story. He's renewing all things in the midst of their brokenness, but they're still broken. And it's important that you know that. It is an information that is critical to you. Um, Romans 8 and, and 8.28 also uh, give us some important information in this. Uh, in Romans 8, this is where God goes into how, like, how all of creation was subjected to futility, which means there was a curse. If you're familiar with Joy to the World, okay, going back to my Christmas carols, there's a, there's a verse in there that talks about the curse being revert, or as far as the curse is found. Um, what that means is like when we died, like I just said, 
everything else had an element of death to it. And, and God, because of the way sin broke in, God brought a curse to this place as a holy and just God must as punishment. And so um, Romans 8 is talking about how not just us, not just individually do we struggle and now um, don't operate the way that we were supposed to, but the world doesn't operate the, world, the way it was supposed to, the way it was intended to, or the way it will one day. This is the land in which we live, a, a broken yet currently being renewed place. It's important that you know that. Because then when he gets to Romans 8.28 and says something like, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. You're, you can't understand the, the goodness of that verse without understanding the information that this place is really seriously broken. So if God can work in the midst of all things, even in the midst of this brokenness, if he can work for those who love him good, man, that is an incredible truth that makes our heart happy, even in the midst of some pretty devastating brokenness. It's a hope that we're going to need as we walk through these things. First Peter 3 through 6 tells us this. Um, in, the, in the midst of Peter talking, he, he says, uh, you know, talking about the mercy of God. And, and what I've done here on the slides is I've just given you kind of the portion of the scripture that is impactful for this portion of the message. But the context of the scripture is Peter's letter, and he's writing about the great mercy of Jesus and things like that. And then he gets down to some suffering. And in the midst of that, he says, here's the deal. Um, that, that we've been born again to an inheritance that's imperishable, it's undefiled and unfading. It's kept in heaven for you. This is important information to know. In this, though, check this out, in this, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to be result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus. Here's what Peter's saying. I know it's going to be incredibly difficult, but you've got to remember it's for a little while. It's for a little while. It may not seem like a little while when it's your child. I get that. The Lord gets that. There's no, we're not, this is not insensitive talk. This is not belittling talk. I know it may not seem like a little while if you want to talk about your particular addiction or your particular history or the school shootings that we see over and over and over. I understand that it doesn't seem like a little while when it has your name on it. It's important information you need, though, or else your heart will run to panic, and panic will say, this will never pass. But in the scope of the way that God keeps economy and time, it's for a little while. It's for a little while. C.S. Lewis writes this, at, at present, we're on the outside. He says, we're, we're like on the wrong side of the door. It's a long quote. He talks about we discern certain things, and then he gets down to this part. He says, we cannot mingle with the pleasures we see, but all the pages of the New Testament, listen to this, are rustling with the rumor that it will not always be so. It's like the whole New Testament, there's this rumor going on that life will not continue as it has forever. This is a rumor to give your life to, folks. This is our hope. This is our truth. It helps us in the midst of gaining the right information because it sets expectations. If you're following along in your outline, this is the first blank. What should I expect? Do you know how helpful it is to have the right expectations in life? You should expect this world to be broken. You should expect sinfulness to still be a part of the story, while at the same time expecting God to be renewing all things in the midst of that. He gives the example of, I thought this was a really great example in the book, and he says, hey, if you were to come to, um, let's say, my, my house, and some of you expected it to be a prison, while some of you expected it to be Delray's finest hotel, those of you who expected it to be a prison might say, this place is really loud, and when, when Casey's wife's away, it's somewhat unkept, and um, 
you know, it's, it's, it's kind of, you know, it's kind of got, it's got some dark spots in there and things, and things could be a little bit better. But for, for, as far as prisons go, this place is pretty awesome. I mean, they got cable TV. They got the baseball package, they Red Sox fans, that's kind of cool. I didn't like the Red Sox, but now that I'm in prison, I've grown to like the Red Sox. They've got these kids that run around. You know, it's a pretty cool gig here that I'm in prison, you know, and I'm not locked up. I've got some space to roam. Now, the same group of people, if the other half came in thinking it was Delray's Finest Hotel, would be like, really? This is Delray's Finest? I mean, this place never shuts up. You know, it's like nonstop. And these, these people, they're not very, they're not good, like, um, concierges, or they're not good, like, pe- hosts. I mean, all they do is make lunches and then clean up when their kids go to bed and then faint on the couch while they're trying to have a conversation. Like, it's, it doesn't seem like it's, they're taking good care of me in Delray's finest hotel. See, it's all about your expectations. Believers in Christ, it's important that you have the right expectations of yourself and of others and of this world around you or else happiness will always elude you. This place doesn't work the way it's supposed to, but it will not always be. And the good work has begun. The second thing hope does is it instructs. It instructs. It's important that that blank right there is this tells me what I should do. What I should do. Listen, if, if I don't have the right information about my suffering, then I'm certainly not gonna know what to do in the midst of my suffering. My heart will be on panic, and I will not know what to do. I will freak out. And again, it's very hard to be freaking out and incredibly happy at the same time. Unless you like won the lottery or something. Then the two can like coincide. But other than that, if I don't know what to do, I'm going to probably like die in my suffering. Although I might still live, I might still have a pulse. I'm going to die in here if I don't know what to do. I had a friend of mine, brother in this church, explain to me, he was on the SWAT team, and he's like, man, when we break down and break into a place, people die from indecision. You're going to die in your suffering if you don't know what to do. Let's look at what to do. Lamentations 3, 24. Um, you might not think this is the book on happiness because people are lamenting in this book, but, but check out what, what Lamentations has to tell us as it, as it pertains to what we do in the midst of our suffering. The Lord is my portion, says my soul, therefore I will hope in him. So the first thing that we do in the midst of our suffering is we are reminded that our great treasure is Jesus, not the end of this suffering. I'm going to say that again. That's a great place for an amen if you don't know. If like, that's a new culture to you, I need to hear like a big amen there because that's really the crux of the sermon. In the midst of the suffering, the author of Lamentations says that, that Jesus is my treasure, not the end of this suffering moment. Amen? Yeah. Yeah. You guys are quick to raise your hand on yeah. How many, I do this, I do that. But, you know, that was a good one. You can, you can play along on the good ones too. If you don't know what to do in the midst of your suffering, be reminded that the end of that suffering is not the goal. Jesus is the goal and you already have the goal, so we need to figure out ways to enjoy the goal more in the midst of that suffering. Oh, you guys are on a roll now. That's awesome. Romans 12, 12 tells us what to do. It says rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfast in prayer. Well, there it is right there. We rejoice, we grow in patience, and we pray. What else do we do? Romans 15, 13 says, Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. So what do we do from that verse? We believe. We believe the truths that instruct us in the midst of this. We believe Romans 8, 28. We believe about what Jesus says, how he's overcome the world. We practice believing. We practice praying. We practice rejoicing. We practice patience. We already know what to do before your divorce hits. You already know what to do before the next school shooting. You already know what to do in the midst of your cancer. You've been given instruction. Psalm 119 says, you are my refuge and my shield. I have put my hope in your word, in your word. In your word, Jesus, and what do I do? Well, I turn to Jesus as my treasure. I turn to him in prayer. I turn to him in his word. I know that I, that I, I, I prepare myself for patience. What should I do? 
It's important to know, it's especially important in the midst of your happiness to know what to do before it happens. The last one here is is, um, one that that ties in directly uh, with our happiness, and it's an inspiration. Inspires, hope inspires us. Um, Listen, without inspiration, my heart will go to its present darkness. Without the inspiration that there's more, without the inspiration that it's not always going to be like this, without inspiration that there's a chapter two behind chapter one, my heart just naturally camps out in the present darkness because it's really dark. It's like really dark. And if that's where your focus goes, if that's where all of your um, energy goes, then it's very easily for you to be uninspired and caught up in just waiting for this to end. Jesus has more. Listen to the inspiration that hope gives us. John 16 says this, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Jesus Jesus is a man of sorrows. He understands what it means to go to the depths of your suffering. And what he's telling you is that he will walk with you through the suffering and come out on the other side and invite you to something more, to something better. 2 Corinthians says this, so we do not lose heart. We do, we do, do not lose heart. I have a hard time saying this to myself, so I'm going to need you to say this to me when you see it on my face and you sense it in my soul. These are not solo scriptures. These are scriptures and truths that are lived out in community. We don't lose heart. Why? Because we know that although we are wasting away We're being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight beyond all glory and all comparison as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. Here's what what the scripture is telling us. You should be inspired that what you're walking through right now is doing something. It is not being wasted. There's a sermon that, that I've heard from John Piper, the portion rings in my head. It's doing something. Your cancer, your loss, listen to me. I'm sorry for it. Man, I'm sorry for it. But do not be uninspired. God is doing something through it. Revelation 21 says, and God will, and God will. There's a lot of things that that the scriptures say that God's going to do, but one of these, I love this, and and God will be the one who wipes away every tear. He's powerful. He's magnificent. He's holy. He's all these things, but he's also the one who wipes away every tear. Have you ever wiped away the tear of a two or three-year-old? I mean, there's just something intimate about that moment. You need to know that your tears will not be wasted or forgotten, but they will be wiped away and accomplish for you something that you could not have without them. I promise you. This last blank tells us what we should imagine. Because I believe that if there's one thing we need to grow in as Christians, it's our holy imagination of what's to come. Tozer says, when the followers of Jesus Christ lose their interest in heaven, they will no longer be happy Christians. Spurgeon says, meditate much on heaven. It will help thee to press on. For the veil of tears is but the pathway to the better country. So we need to close. And we're going to close and we're going to come to the table. And we're going to celebrate communion. And this is for us uh, a feast of our hope. This is where we're reminded of all these things. And before we do that, um, I just, I wanted to tell you this because I think it's really important. As it pertains to hope, man, oftentimes it's like a journey. You have it and then you lose it. And there's just, there's just three like phrases that I felt like the Lord gave me that he wanted you to hear. And the first one is get hope. If you don't have hope in Jesus, um, we want to invite you now to put your faith in the person and work of Jesus Christ and get hope. We want to invite you to do that right now. I'm going to lead you through a prayer. 
and give you the opportunity to do that. If you have hope, maybe you came in here and, and you've, you've lost it. And so this, the second thing I think the Lord wants you to hear is protect hope. At all costs, protect your hope. Don't you give it away. Don't you grow lazy in pursuing it. Don't you let anyone, including yourself, steal it away. You protect your hope as though it were your lifeline. You stay in the word. You stay in community. You stay in fellowship with Jesus. And then finally, share hope. The hope that you have in Jesus is not just for you. It's for others. I have for years struggled with this at times crippling, I would call it, anxiousness. I hate it and would choose anything else beside it. But here's what I'm learning. That hope in Christ informs me that there's a brokenness that he's still working out in me. The hope of Christ instructs me that my treasure is not the lack of anxiety, but Jesus and Jesus alone. And it inspires me that he's begun a good work of renewing my heart that goes to that dark place. But Jesus invites me to more, even now. And even in the midst of my struggle and even in the midst of your struggle, the truth is for those of us in Christ, the renewing has started today. And I'm here to share with you that there is great hope as we continue to turn our gaze to Jesus and ask him to come into that dark space and do what only he can do. There is great healing and there is great hope. I can tell you that from experience. As we come to the table now, we, we turn our hearts to celebrating what has been accomplished for us and what is being accomplished. And we're reminded of Jesus' body and blood that was broken for us. We're going to ask um, you in, in just a moment to pray. And, and if you're a believer in Christ and, and you find yourself, you know, pursuing Jesus, not perfectly, but pursuing Jesus, there's no area in your life where he's convicted you and you're, you're withholding him. You're, you're just pursuing him as humbly and uh, as, in, as intentionally as you can. We, we want you to come and be encouraged with the hope that this table represents. If you're not a believer or you find yourself like at odds with the Lord, not willing to surrender areas of your life, we would just invite you to stay and let today be a day where you ask the Lord to, to do a, a different and better work in your heart. You'll take the, the juice and the bread and you'll go back to your seat and we'll, we'll all take together and then we'll, we'll finish up that way. Father, help us in this moment. There are those of us in this midst, including myself, who need to be spiritually nourished through this meal. I pray that you would meet us in our place. That we might be able to confront the reality of some brokenness and darkness while tasting the joy that is ours in Christ. Father, I pray for those who have never surrendered their life to you, that even right now, as they've been hearing about the hope of Jesus, the hope of the world, they would come in, in their hearts and minds, they would express to you, Jesus, I believe that you are my great treasure and hope. I surrender my life to you. I believe you died for me and now want to live in me. I give you my life. And I accept your hope. Forgive me and change me. Come to him in that way. And Jesus will be your hope. Christ in your name. Amen. You can come when you're ready. So I just got this image because it took us a moment to let everyone partake and pass out the elements that like the Lord is patient, the Lord is kind, and he wants everyone in. He's inviting, he's working, he's, his love is wooing people every day. And this is a meal when it comes to finality and all things are made new and he comes back, he's not going to rush it. He's going to make sure he has all those he wants and has called because it's too good to miss. So our hope lies in a Savior who was both broken, killed, and then resurrected with your name and my name, his Father's name written all over him. 
take and eat. And on that same night after he broke the bread and said this do in remembrance of my body, he also took the cup and said, this is poured out for the forgiveness of sin. Do this as a memory of me. And then Paul in the New Testament says that it's also looking forward to that day when all of the inspiration and imagination comes true beyond our wildest dreams. Take and drink. So Lord Jesus, we say thank you. We worship you. We worship you in this moment. We've had an encounter with you. We can sense you and we can feel you. We know that you have touched areas and places where no one else could touch and we're believing that you brought life. We want to say thank you because you picked up your life first so that you could do these sort of things. Jesus, would you increase our hope? Would you increase our happiness? Would you increase our joy in the midst of sorrow so that we might not only experience more of you, but be a blessing and a treasure to others? We love you, Lord Jesus, and we pray these things in your name. Amen. So I'm going to ask you to rise and I'm going to pronounce a benediction over you and we're going to be dismissed and go out in peace. We will have prayer partners up front here because I believe today may be a day where the Lord's dealing with you on something particular and it would be good to share that with somebody else to the degree you're comfortable with and receive prayer over that specifically because as you know, one of the things that we do in the midst of pursuing hope and happiness is pray. So come and receive prayer because we believe that actually changes things in God's divine order. I'll, receive, I'll, I'll pronounce the benediction, we'll dismiss, and then we'll keep some music going and we'll ask you to come forward if you'd like prayer. The benediction is a promise, so receive this promise. Now may the Lord make his face to shine upon his people. May he meet them in their joys and in their sorrows. May he meet you when it's very bright and when it's overwhelmingly dark. And may he warm your soul and gently turn your eyes to him that you might receive Christ for both yourself and those you love. Amen and amen. Love you guys.